thank you, thank you. It's good to see everybody. I hope you can hear me all right. I'm standing today. Man, I feel like I can worship when I stand. Wow. Uh, goodness of God. That was my goodness. Uh, my goodness. Yeah, just so grateful to uh, be in all of your presence. And of course, I'm thankful to God and for all uh, that he is doing right now. Uh, there's so much going on in our world today and a lot of pain, a lot of challenge and a lot of struggle. And we're seeing wars all over. But at the same time, I see amazing things taking place. And just an example, I was uh, this past Sunday and on Friday, I was at a turkey drive. And for some reason, Pastor Michael knows, uh, New York decided to be absolutely freezing cold. Just just knocked me out. Just whoop, my California body was just like crumpled up and just just like that. Just like, <laughs> like why? Uh, but it, it just like dropped. It dropped. And uh and and even like DeAndre and I were out yesterday. DeAndre is on the call. It's just freezing, frigid, cold. But uh at the same time, uh, we had this turkey giveaway. And on Friday night, we were having a young adult gathering in Harlem and and we got a call halfway through the gathering, and and the topic of the night was, you know, about uh, you have the freedom to take responsibility. That was the that was the topic, and um, we got a call, and we were asked to help with this turkey giveaway that was happening two blocks away with a minister, Apostle Stacy Ramos, and uh, like like it was like soldiers in the army. We had just got juiced with this word about responsibility, and uh, we all just rose and we booked it outside in the freezing cold and we were handling like it was like I don't know something like 90 turkeys that we were handling and and they ended up getting a lot more and then on Sunday we were out there again in the freezing cold handing out turkeys and uh just trying to do good for the people in the city and uh it was it was it's not like I haven't done a turkey giveaway but something was precious about this one and that was I would you know towards the end of the turkey giveaway uh we had a we were just we had just stuff to clean up and we had all these boxes and boxes of turkeys and then once you give out all the turkeys now you just have boxes and so we had to clean up all the boxes and break them down and when your hands are like frozen solid and you try to rip open boxes it's like knives it's just, it's just like ah <laughs> and then there was a, a few kids that were doing it with it with my wife and i it was like my wife's birthday and i was like full time i was like repenting i was like oh my birthday. <laughs> someone's gonna hit <laughs> uh criticized me but anyway she wanted to be out there with me and uh we're uh breaking down these boxes and these kids joined us that kind of just came from around the street and uh um and then i noticed that while we were breaking down the boxes i was getting to know them and just saying hi and you know uh you know just just chatting and and getting to know this person that i'm with that i've never met and i noticed that the apostle stacy ramos over there she was crying I was wondering, I was like, man, did something happen? Why is she crying? And after we finished all the boxes, put it away, the kids went back to their to their homes or went back to their cars. She came up to us and she said, you know why I'm crying? I'm crying because those are the kids that I see on the street that are on, on a daily basis active with gun violence. And uh and, and you were you were just, you know, you were just, you know, doing something good with them. And when I saw that, it broke me down in tears because I know that that's one more gate opened, one more door open for them to find Jesus, to find salvation, to be saved, and to walk a new path in their life. And I couldn't help but just like feel like, wow, I, this is just like a simple. I'm just, you know, I'm with my wife, frozen solid, and we're just we're just chatting. We're just we're just just you know just having a good time with someone. And you don't realize their story. You don't realize their walk. And you don't, you don't recognize that actually that, that kid, she was telling us he was strapped. He was strapped. He, he, he's, he's part of the local gangs. He's, he's, but he was introduced to something that allows him to get a step closer. And I'm, I don't know if I'll ever meet the kid again. I hope I do. Now, I'll remember his name. His name is Rico. You know, at least one of them, his name is Rico. And I remember his face. And I hope one day I do see him. But what became so clear to me was, you know, my wife and I maybe not have gone to that turkey, turkey give out. We may not have been there. We may not have been able to share that moment 
and to open up that gate. We had to make an active decision to go out there in the cold on Friday night and Sunday night and, and be there even on my wife's birthday to make that kind of decision. And of course, I took her out to ramen afterwards and we went to a movie, we saw Wakanda forever, you know, and we had a good time, don't worry, I'm a good husband, <laughs> I'm trying to be at least. But the idea was that we chose to walk what the Bible calls the narrow road, the narrow path. And, uh, and, and that's really the, the, the center of this message tonight. And the, the message, the title that I landed on was from faith to substance. And the question that I want to pose to you as you reflect on this is, what does it really mean to be a Christian? What does it actually mean? By definition, it means that you are a follower of Christ. You're a follower of Christ. But in 1 John 2, 6, if you can open up your Bible, if you can get there uh, or open up your phones, in 1 John 2, 6, it says, whoever says that he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. And then further in that verse, it says in 1 John 2, 9, whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in the darkness. And in, in verse 11, it goes on and it says, the darkness has blinded his eyes. And so when I read these verses, I, I come to a very clear understanding of what it actually means to be a Christian. To be a follower of Christ requires you to be like Christ. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he has walked. That it's not enough just to follow the man, not just to follow him and, and, and receive all that we can receive from him. We have to emulate who Jesus was. So in the word Christian, it means to be like Christ. And so we often hear the, the phrase, and it's a very controversial phrase because everyone takes it out of context, and that is faith without works is dead. And we're taking from James. Faith is without works is dead. And some people have taken that and says, well, by works, without works, you cannot receive salvation. And that's totally wrong, first of all. You know, this does not mean that we are justified or, or we're saved by our works. And what it, what, it, what it means is that if we want to be complete with God, if we want to be true Christianity and embody it in the, the very the very essence of what it means to walk in the same way that he has walked, we have to have works. We can receive salvation, but that is one for oneself. Jesus, if we emulate Jesus, requires us to not be for ourselves. That's the essence of who Jesus was. That's what, you know, when, when we think about Christianity, it's not about salvation. In fact, it's not. It's through the salvation that we receive. It's who we become complete with God. We emulate who Jesus was. We try our best, at least. All of us are falling short, except for Remy Tapier, Uncle Remy, he's there. All of us are falling short, but we make the effort to be there. How we emulate Jesus. And that's why Jesus says it's not enough just to love the Lord. It says there's two great commandments. What are they? Love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, every fiber of your being. You love the Lord. And in that, you break down on your knees and you allow God to enter your life and you receive eternal grace. But there is a commandment that is like it. And that is that we have to love our neighbor. And we love our neighbor as God loves us. As we've received from God, we then give everything to others. And everything, in verse 40 in Matthew 20, 22, it says, and everything depends on this. So when I think about the qualities of Jesus, what are we emulating? What are we trying to embody in our life? It's to love God, to love people, and as Jesus said to his disciples, to love the world, make disciples of all nations, to care about one, not just oneself, and not just one's own people, but to care about the world. 
And what he does in all those things, and, and this was what my professor at, 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 at the theology school taught me. He said, really, the essence of Jesus's quality is that in those things, in loving God, in loving people, and in loving the world, he practiced what we call compassion. Compassion. And I don't have time to go into it, but that's an amazing word. It means to know someone where they're at, to meet them where they're at, and, and to show them a better way. That's why when Jesus meets people, he doesn't just say, hey, follow me. He gives them something. He, he asks them questions. He has conversation. He listens to them. And then he shows them amazing things. He, he, he describes to them another way of life, and he asks them to please follow me. I'll show you. I will walk with you to that direction. I'm not going to just say this to you and then go my own different way, but I will walk with you in that new direction. That's Jesus's quality. And there was no differentiation between Jesus's love for God and his love for the people. That was synonymous. They are the same in his heart. And that's what I feel is the narrow road, the narrow path in Matthew 7, 13 to 14. It says that small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life and only a few find it, only a few. When I look at the world, I, I don't think few people have received salvation. Oh gosh, we have how many billion, Pastor Michael? How many billion Christians do we have? I, I, I don't know the exact number. We just, by the way, as of last week, Friday, we finally passed the 8 billion mark. We are an 8 billion person population. Go look it up. Wait, don't look it up. Look it up later after, <laughs> after TLO. But we passed the 8 billion mark. We are officially, you, you can no longer, Mother Moon can no longer say 7.8 billion people. She has to say 8 billion people and we need to say it. Right? And 5 billion of them have received one. Well, maybe not five. Something around half of them are quote unquote Christians who believe in Jesus, believe in God. But the road that's narrow is not the road that they're all walking. Now, the road that's narrow requires us to actually perfect our character. To be, and perfect is, is a word of completeness, to be complete with God. To be complete with God means to practice how God lives, how God lives. And it, it, it requires us, and, and the fact is, if we want to perfect our character, it requires us to interact with people. You cannot be perfect and be that, 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 that guru at the top of the mountain who has no relationship with anyone else. I'm sorry, that is not, I, I apologize, that is not perfection. Perfection of character requires you to interface with somebody. It has to be somebody that then you relate with and you learn about yourself and you grow yourself through that person. That's how we perfect our character. So yes, we can follow God's word all we want, but we have to grow our character through our relationships with people. That's how we become true Christians. That's the narrow road. And few are those that walk that path, but those that choose to do so find what? They find life. They find life, and that's what we're fighting for. So when I'm talking about faith to substance, I'm not talking about the definition of faith. <laughs> you know, uh, faith is the substance of things hoped for. No, no, not, I'm not there. I'm not, you know, substance can also be, you know, retranslated in other ways. But what I'm talking about is the substance of relationships. It's, it's, it's the Joshua and Takayo going out and, and passing turkeys out and breaking boxes with kids that are involved in gun violence. You know, that, that the, the substance of the faith practiced and the key is not you, it's not us. It never has been. And that's where uh, I feel as YCLC, we want to challenge the notion that as Christians, as we're developing and the message that we deliver to our members and to our leaders is we have to evolve our message. It's the same word, it's the same scripture, but to understand the substance of things, the yes, receive Jesus in your life, but please, Fight to practice, fight to interact, and fight to share that love with others. It comes as a requirement for your completeness to find life. And so when we look at the Bible and the biblical history, other than Abraham, most of our 
providential biblical figures, they had no problem in their faith with God. Now, Abraham had a little bit of an issue, right? He fell, he fell asleep. He lost his way. He didn't cut that dove. I don't know why it was so difficult to cut a dove, but he just didn't do it the right way. He did it in, he got arrogant, right? He got, maybe it was too easy and he became, you know, it was so simple that he became arrogant to the task. But other than Abraham, what most of our biblical figures struggled with was what? People. They struggled with people. Moses had a communion with God that you don't see very often. He talked to God a lot. It wasn't his relationship with God that made him struggle. It was the fact that his people were complaining all the time. And it got him to a point of deep, deep, deep frustration to the point where God says, speak into the rock, and he decides to hit it instead, right? And, 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 and he goes against God's way. The key is always pain. It's not that you have Abel in his able position where he's received from by God, and he's given all of God's blessings and grace and love. But it's that person that he is meant to love. So it's, it's not Jacob, it's Esau. And it's actually, it's not... It's not necessarily Jesus. Jesus, it was always about the lady at the well. It was always about the disciples. The key, actually, and I'll just take my name, for example. I believe when I study, when I study Josh, Joshua in the Bible, it wasn't about Joshua. It was about Caleb. When I really think about it, if Caleb wasn't there, I know I'm a Joshua. I understand Joshua's. Without Caleb, we are, we are hopeless. We need a friend in this business. Oh my God, if I don't have Pastor Michael White from Asami on my side, God, Joshua would not have come back. I believe this from my core of my core. As a Joshua, I know he would not have come back to Moses and made a good report if he didn't have a brother with him to just, just to confide with. It was about Caleb. It's not about the one who's touched by God. It's about that because God touches this person, how can I love more people through him? How can I share that love with others? And so for the, why I asked that question earlier about the city is that it's not about our own church. And I got to say this, even to us as young, as, as those of the unification Christian world, it's not about our own church. It's about the city. It's about those who are not touched by God. And we can't just put on programs to lift ourselves up if we are going to expect the city to lift us up. This is a huge misunderstanding that I came to a realization in Manhattan about. DeAndre knows what I'm talking about. If we are not willing to go down and hand out the turkeys and do the groundwork and hug the people and be with them where they're, where they're challenged at their core, they will never lift you back up. If you took the Abel and Cain story and you consider whether Abel took a moment, just entertain the idea. Think about two brothers. Just, you know, just think about it in the realm of two brothers. If Abel had took a moment and said, hey, Cain, how about I show you how to do it right? Do you think there would have been a different outcome? I think totally there would. Of course, that's not within the scripture itself, but we understand that this is a relationship between two brothers. What was stopping Abel, this man blessed by God, chosen for whatever right? I don't know. God Does God love meat more than vegetables? I, I don't know. right? But he was chosen by God if he could have just met Cain where he's at and helped him to figure it out. That I hope we can embody as Christians now and in our city we often feel like oh this city is that god is being removed from the city we're being attacked by the city or they're passing laws against us that there's like there's principalities against us but at the same time we have to ask ourselves whether us as a church as a body of believers are taking time to really meet the city where it's at extend a hand and show them the way out to really be there, to be like Jesus and the lady at the well, to show the deepest compassion. So I, I think, uh, you know, when we talk about the Abel and Cain story as, uh, as Father Mother Moon go really deep into it, but I feel that we are in that position of Abel. We're in the position of Abel. 
And our goal is to have Cain surrender. We're in the position of Jacob. We want Esau to see the face of God in us. We want to get, we want to give so much to them like Jacob does. He gives everything so that Esau cannot deny that God is in this man's face, that God is in this man's spirit. We have to get to that point, but Cain does not surrender easily. And this is where I'll close with just describing how it happens, just so that we're prepared to go into this. And my encouragement tonight is that in the substance of our faith, in the substance of our faith, we have to make the effort of creating relationships on the ground with people and helping one by one lift them up, lift your city up, identify the issue and go there, go there. And how Cain surrenders himself to God's love is very difficult. One, it requires Abel to cultivate himself. Jacob had to cultivate himself for 21 years under Uncle Laban, his Uncle Laban. He had to cultivate his heart, his attitude, his mind, his spirit, and his foundation. He had to cultivate those things. And I break it down into three things. One is cultivate his love for God, faith. He then had to cultivate his love for other people. Abel, us, Christianity, we have to cultivate our love for other people. And third, we have to cultivate our concern for heaven. And by that, I mean our heavenly walk, our heavenly lifestyle, the example that we show to other people because we're concerned about where we end up in heaven. We're concerned about the heavenly nature of things. And when we cultivate those things, faith, love, and a concern for heaven, a heavenly way of life, and we start to practice that love unto Cain and to show them a new way of life, show, show those who do not know God a new way of life and meet them where they're at and love on them what we always will receive at the end, at always, without fail. To me, it's the litmus test of whether you're trying to make a difference is you will be persecuted. You will receive Satan's right hook and jab. You will, because you're trying to do something right. And that's where we always struggle because it doesn't work out in the beginning. We get persecuted, something doesn't work out. A family member attacks us. We start to look at things different and we get jaded and we're like, we're never gonna do that again. But in reality, that's part of the process of getting Cain to surrender. When you push Cain into a corner with God's love, first thing that Cain's gonna do is try to fight his way out away from it. He's gonna try to fight his way out. Persecution always comes, but the key is our perseverance through the persecution, whether we're willing to shed the sweat, the blood, and the tears, and allow ourselves to fall on the knife, to feel that pain, and you just lift it up to God, and you keep on going. And that's why we create this community, so that we have people we stand with in that time. But we have to persevere. And when we persevere and persevere and persevere, then finally, Cain realizes what he has done. He feels ashamed, actually, regretful. He feels grief and chooses to surrender himself. That's how we win the city. So you see your issues in your city. The city will persecute you. You cultivate yourself and you decide to go out there on the front line. The city will persecute you. But if you continue to persevere and you build the family around you to fight that battle, persevere, persevere through it, then Cain has no choice in the end but to give up and to surrender and recognize his mistake. And, what, and then what Cain will say is, Abel or whoever, you as my leader, please rest. I'll take it from here. And that's the ticket. And I've had many experiences with this in my life where I've been deeply persecuted. By, I mean, I've, I've been even kicked off of campuses at schools, you know? But we didn't give up. We persevered through it. And at the end of it all, Satan surrenders. And we grow. Our faith cultivates. And that is becoming the righteous person. That's becoming that one person that God can use. And I feel that that's the age that we're in now. Uh, this kind of this new truth or this uh, new expression of truth from the same scripture, what we need to pull out of ourselves as Christianity 
is the dignity of faith, that, 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 that cultivation of love, that great concern for heaven, and choose to go the narrow road, the path of building true relationships and changing people's lives, offering them transformation, not just accepting our own grace, our own salvation. Amen. And I think that starts with our own communities. So as a pastor or as a minister or whoever you are, God has called you to be where you're at to make that difference. Father Moon always talks about the 360 degrees around us, right? Uncle Remy, that was the, that was the, the, the your, St. Lucia is that 360 degrees around us. That's your mission. That's your mission. So, uh, yeah, I, it's a narrow road, but I'm with you there. That's why we're here as YCLC. We stand together to be true Christians. And I know that's, that's how we bring about this kingdom of heaven on earth. So thank you so much.